This micro lecture is on fossil fuels. It is important to remember that fossil fuels are all just biomass that has been processed by Earth. However, Earth doesn't produce as much biomass as it used to, so most of the fossil fuels we enjoy today were formed from biomass that existed well over a hundred million years ago. It's not just the formation of oil, it's also the existence of enough biomass and the right kinds of biomass and the right ecosystems to support oil formation. That's a whole earth thing. Please take a moment to review this week's learning objectives. So what carbon resource do we start with? Oil made organic chemistry a part of our everyday lives. And at this point, we're quite capable of using any carbon source to support all of our needs. So, if all of the carbon sources are natural, and therefore not inherently bad, how do you choose? Start with the facts. There are three major classes of fossil fuels, petroleum, coal, and natural gas. I will not have time to go over all of these in detail, but if you are interested in fossil fuels, you should Google anything you don't know. There are many different types of petroleum, but most can be categorized as one of the three mentioned. Sweet light crude, heavy crude, and a variety of crudes that are listed on the stock exchange. Likewise, there are four major types of coal and peat from which many coals form. Anthracite, bituminous, subbituminous, and lignite. Natural gas really only comes in two types, wet and dry, but knowing the difference between wet and dry and the differences between LNG and NGLs is extremely helpful given all the gas news in the media these days. LNG is liquefied natural gas, like the kind loaded on large tankers that cross the ocean very different from NGLs, which are natural gas liquids, or the heavier chemicals in the natural gas that have to be condensed out of it before it can be commercially produced. So how is petroleum formed? There is a large body of work that researches this area, but the general idea is that petroleum is an oil and forms from biological sources rich in oil, beginning as a mineral called kerogen. Aquatic plants are the primary biological source of petroleum. Terrestrial plants have not contributed much to the petroleum reserves we utilize today. Aquatic plants, just like land plants, have cell walls composed of cellulose or cellulose-like molecules. However, aquatic organisms are a unique and convenient source of fatty acids, and lignin is a structural chemistry that isn't needed by cells floating in water. So, without getting into the chemistry too much, this means that oil is formed from a very unique class of aquatic organisms, not to be confused with the terrestrial organisms or organisms that live on land. We produce petroleum by drilling for it. So how do we drill? One of the most popular methods these days is directional drilling. Driving a directional drill rig is like flying a spaceship through the earth. Subsurface techniques have advanced to a degree that we can use things like 40 seismic mapping to steer a drill over seven miles deep and then seven miles horizontally over and around undrillable obstacles, eventually hitting a target area the size of a bus. We don't always have to drill with that level of complexity, but we can, and that is incredible. The most advanced drill rig in the world is Exxon's Sakhalin-1, nicknamed the Hawk. It has drilled a well that is deeper at 40,000 feet than Everest is tall, and after hitting that depth was steered horizontally for miles with an accuracy of up to a few feet. It is incredible. This is important. Earth's oil reserves will probably continue to produce for a very long time. They are based on something called technically recoverable reserves, and technically recoverable reserves change with technology and economics, so it's almost impossible to say what the total amount of oil available to us is. This is partly why nearly overnight, 
the U.S. became one of the world's largest oil producers again after decades of falling behind. What we have nearly depleted is the cheap, easy oil, as this old assessment shows. The reserves of sweet, light crude that the world became used to in the 1980s are nearly gone, and what's remaining is still oil, but it's heavy and it's full of sulfur, and it's not as desirable. However, it is still quite functional as oil. So how is coal formed? Ironically, coal is also formed from kerogen, the same mineral that oil is formed from, only it is a very different kind of kerogen. Coal is a product of geologic pyrolysis and forms from plant matter composed of sugars and aromatics. Land plants are the primary biological source of coal. Aquatic plants have not contributed much to the coal reserves we utilize today. When land plants are exposed to increasing geologic pressure and temperature across a long period of time, they start to lose gas in the form of methane, CO2, and water, and slowly evolve into coal, moving from lignite, which is very peat-like, through subbituminous, bituminous, and eventually anthracite, the hardest coal. Coal is produced by mining, just like diamonds, gold, and other metals, and it uses the largest bulldozers, dump trucks, and cranes on Earth. How it is mined is very different depending on where it is found. In the eastern U.S., it is found in mountainous regions, and mountaintop removal strip mining does severe environmental damage. In the western U.S., it is found in the plains, and it is also strip mined, but because everything is so flat, the environmental damage is far less severe. Coal from the western United States, particularly the Powder River Basin in Wyoming, is low in sulfur, which is good, but it also has a lower energy content. Coal from the eastern U.S. is higher in sulfur, which is bad, but it generally has a higher energy content, which is desirable. There are almost no sources of anthracite, the highest energy content coal, west of the Mississippi. So there are a lot of decisions that have to be made about why, where power plants get their coal. Though it is not appealing due to the way we currently use coal, when oil gets too expensive, we will probably move on to coal as our primary carbon source. We are currently wasteful with our coal because it is so cheap and plentiful compared to oil. Almost no petroleum is burned for electricity anymore, even though it used to be common. Why is this? Considered from a carbon mineral perspective, coal is very undervalued and will almost certainly be tapped as a resource for the production of carbon materials in the future. For now, it is primarily valued for its carbon content and thus energy content. But as oil gets expensive, this will probably change. Humanity's addiction to carbon energy may someday wane, but our addiction to carbon will never end. There's simply no other element like it at Earth conditions. So here we have the three major types of fossil fuels. I am missing one last major reserve of carbon. I would like you to think for the next couple slides about what it might be. Natural gas is produced much the same way that oil is, by drilling. Both gas and oil can be produced by fracking, and directional drilling is used for both gas and oil production. That said, gas wells have some unique challenges, and there are some that contain gas pressures at greater than 10,000 psi. Remember, natural gas only became the heating standard in about the 1950s, so our focus on gas is fairly new. The DOE and George Mitchell get a lot of credit for the current gas boom for working since the 1970s to figure out how to economically produce this resource and connect it to in-place infrastructure. When you have a moment, please visit some of the websites provided and learn more about these developments. This is a map of the current estimated gas reserves in the world. Remember the slide on oil formation? 
Gas is formed far more commonly than oil, and it is also formed during coal formation. So there is a lot of gas out there. I am not sure how long fracking reserves will last, but I do suspect that by the time fracking shale gets old, we will probably figure out how to utilize methane hydrates. Methane hydrates are a form of natural gas trapped in ice crystals found at the bottom of the ocean near all of the continental shelves on Earth. This is worth reading about if you're not familiar with the terms. The amount of carbon available in methane clathrates is enormous. 3,000 gigatons is a lot of carbon. Each type of fossil fuel has strengths and weaknesses. Petroleum is high in cost, but has many uses. Coal is the lowest cost by a huge margin, but has much fewer uses. Natural gas falls in the middle on cost, and has an increasing number of uses, but still not as many as petroleum. So what is the last major carbon reserve? What have we missed? It is CO2. Humans output about 30 gigatons of CO2 a year, and the oceans probably contain on the order of 400 gigatons. This is rapidly becoming a more interesting source of carbon. The current price of industrial CO2 is 20 to $30 a ton and dropping. It's not unreasonable to think that the lowest cost sources of carbon on Earth in the future will be both coal and CO2. In closing, what does this graph mean to you? I would propose that our CO2 emission problem is not from fossil fuels, but from burning things in general. Furthermore, Earth has had much higher levels of CO2 and still supported life, just not human life. Earth will probably weather the CO2 issue just fine, but humans may not.